to be fair, I wouldn't want to listen to us if I had no idea what we were talking about. Which half the time, to be fair, I don't. But, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I get points for trying. Good morning, welcome to the Hobby Breakfast Show, kicking off your morning with Wargaming Chats. As always, your hosts this morning are myself, Bonards, and we have the Mayor. Good morning, everyone. I'm very excited uh, for this week's episode. And he, he's very excited because OT is not here. Yeah, uh, what, what other reason would a man have to be excited? Um, no, it's because... Uh, uh, I mean, OT is the cynic, the 40k cynic. So in, in OT's absence, we're going to be talking about some 40k this week. Yeah. Um, so we have a chance. Stay tuned. Right. And transition. Transition. <laughs> Seamless. Uh, before we move on to our main topic, then, let's just quickly have a chat about news. So there's been a couple releases uh, we can talk about Games Workshop. Um, there's a new guard tank, the Rogal Dawn Battle Tank. Whoop. Wow. Which Pretty is cool. a full model. It's really big, isn't it? I don't know if you've yeah. um, seen it next door to like the Lehman Russ. It's like properly. I have, but I've, I've not seen it next to a Bane Blade. Is it? Smaller than a bane blade, it must I be smaller than a bane blade. The bane blade. It, it is a kind of um, why why does it exist sort of thing in terms of it's like that mid mid range of tank, but it's like one of those things where you kind of question why they needed a mid range tank, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it's to sell people more, more tanks. The interesting thing will be price, <laughs> it's probably going to be more expensive than the old bane blade, isn't it? To like actually buy, which is it gonna probably be will. I mean, I think it's it looks a lot cooler. It looks more like I, I used to have a toy that looks exactly like this. It's got yeah. a guy on the back with the gun, like the the Sherman, like you were saying. It's got all the like little decorations around the tank. Um, I mean, the it's got a hull mounted gun that is essentially the main gun of a Lee Russ, from what I can tell. Um, so it, it just has like so many guns is ridiculous yeah i think it it has like an option for um either the gatling or demolisher cannon that the um yeah. lehman russ it looks like a slightly smaller version of lehman russ's main gun but then it looks like it can take either like a double barreled battle cannon so yeah. that's like double double a lehman russ as the, the turret weapon or it can take like some ridiculously like high caliber it almost looks like a basilisk um, gun, doesn't it? Yeah, but so it's, it's got, got it's got like a square end, doesn't it? Yeah, and you can you can have um, it looks like melters on the front, and um, yeah, it's got two, two little melters. It's got sponsons. It's got the the little machine gun on top. Um, so it's following in the tradition of just put more guns on stuff that forty k seems to be turning into at the moment. It looks like um, you, you only actually have to take... Because the, the the last picture on the page, the tank behind doesn't have any sponsons and it doesn't have those two at the front. So I, I think it's probably only going to be mandatory to take the main the main gun and probably the whole mounted gun. Yeah, I imagine that there will be options. Although, as with the Lehman Russ, everyone always does take the sponsons. So it's a bit kind of like... True, yeah. You want to take it. I, I wonder if it's going to be a bit of a... Um, like the orcs when they got the Gorknaut and the Morknaut, which are the same price. What, what as... underwhelming. Yeah, and they're the same price, like monetary value wise, as the Stomper. So I feel like it's yeah. probably going to be a kind of. Like, mm. it, it's going to be so difficult to price it where people are going to be like, well, I might as well just buy a Bane Blade. Or, or it's going to be too good, and then people are never going to take a Bane Blade. This is why yeah. I, I, I don't always understand. I, I realise it's just because they want to make new things that people buy it, but I don't always I guess Bane Blades are also like Forge World specific, aren't they? Whereas this looks like a... Are they not? Are they plastic? Uh, there's a plastic one. has been oh, quite a while. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, 
what they'll do is they'll just make this tank really good and then people will buy it. Yeah. <laughs> people are, are, are tier list um tier list whores, aren't they? They'll find whatever yeah, but... whatever wins and be like, Oh yeah, I'll make that. It, it's it's cool. Personally, cool I think it would have been cooler to like bring out like a bigger version of the um um Sentinel. The Walker. I was just thinking that as well, yeah. But I, I, I guess then it would be like, is that too much like ad mech? I think Maybe. there's a way they could have done it. They could have made a new a new thing. Yeah, or they could have made a tank that's not a battle tank. Yeah. It's not like they're short on creativity. Or, or this they, doesn't or they, really show a lot. They could have done like a, a, a big like troop transport tank or like something. Like something which you can like put like a yeah, like a shock assault like type thing. Load, loads of troops in. Yeah. I also want to know why, like, they've gone and called it Rogal Dawn um, after the Primarch of the Imperial Fists, which seems like a bit of an insult to Lehman Russ, the Primarch. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Like, fuck, fuck you, Lehman Russ. Yeah. Get a shitty, shitty a little tank. To be fair, Rogal Dawn yeah, probably yeah. is. It probably is cooler. Well, I don't know. But any anyway, yeah. And then the other thing which um I I am probably more excited about is the new Warcry box, which has a really cool chameleon skink um warband. I don't know if you've seen this. I have, yeah. Um I did look at them briefly. I think it's cool that it's it's obviously like in they haven't just picked a different variation of like a faction that kind of exists like this is quite funky obviously like chameleon skinks exist in one fancy but the these mod like those models are ancient and resin yeah. and shit and these are like really nice sculpts i like this is i'm guessing what we're expecting for the uh lizard men refresh now which is awesome and they come with these cool like little pterodactyl things as yeah, well they look super cool and then the chaos warband they're fighting against looks really cool as well where they've got these kind of like stone Jeez, i assume okay. they're masks rather than their heads made of stone they are masks yeah but they're, they're really cool yeah they've got like, whole... the one guy that has like a giant obelisk on his back is that actually on his back is it like a i think it it looks like it's floating to me, doesn't it? It does, but obviously it can't be. It's got to be attached. It will be attached, but I'm guessing it's one of those um, optical illusion things where they attach it via something that isn't actually holding it. Sure. Um, yeah. And it also comes with this weird, like, demon. I don't know if you've spotted that, like, the last photo. I, it has, did. Like, I wasn't really sure what to make of it. Bird demon, which it mentions as um, the figure carrying a chunk of the Colossal Jade monument that first birthed the bird-like speaker so i'm guessing this is like what they worship hmm. is it a they've bit zinchy yeah they've got an interesting aesthetic though they they have like some of them have like hammers and chisel so apparently they go around um destroying uh like the symbols of the other factions i think That's it's a really cool. a really solid um box though like both yeah. factions are really cool the terrain it comes with is pretty cool. The it like really nice, like, yeah. Walkways and stuff. Um, I'm probably not going to get it just because I don't think I can justify buying more more shit right now. Okay, that means you're going to buy it as always. What was the last thing you said you wasn't you weren't going to buy? I don't think you bought it yet. I don't. I, I don't. I don't think I've said that I'm not going to buy anything and then bought it recently, have I? No, I, I think I, you've been a good boy. I, I have. Well, I've got my plan of I've bought a load of stuff, so I'm not buying anything now until next spring, which is going to be wow. really cool. That's quite a commitment. Yeah. It, was, yeah, all, it, it was all those Forge World Hobbits. Like, <laughs> I, I, they probably used up your budget for quite a while, I imagine. Yeah. yeah. They'll be worth it, though. Aren't you it taking be. them to the doubles? No, I'm taking a different list of the doubles. Uh, oh, I'm what are you using these hobbits for? They're, they're for my all hero hobbit list with Gandalf. Okay. Um, which I'm mostly building just because I want the um, 
Hobbit heroes, but I didn't want to build the um, like a gazillion militia and sheriffs. I just yeah. wanted to have the nice little Hobbit sculpts. So that that's what I've gone with there. Anyway, I think that is. Oh no, we haven't talked about um, the kill team box selling out. Oh yeah, yeah. The I think Aris Karskin. Kar Kar Can't say. Yeah. It. So Crap this one had the the Necrons and the the new Imperial Guard dudes. Um, yeah. And it sold out before the old box had sold out. So you can still buy Into the Dark, which is the one with the uh, Navy Greets, which I think are actually really cool, and the uh, Crete, which, again, really cool. Mm. But then this one, which is just um, some reboxed Necrons with essentially what is fancy veteran guards, has sold out. Um, so they must not have made many. Yeah, I, yeah, that that can be my only conclusion as well. But what from what I've seen, the two teams from the Into the Dark aren't that good. They're pretty shit, but they're both pretty shit. So they work well together. But um, I've heard that the Kraskin cast the the K no the Cadian guys the Spec Ops yeah called in Kraskin in the new box. Yeah, apparently they're not very good from what I've heard. No, they're not very good either. And the Necrons are like a slight upgrade on their rules from the compendium. Um, I but... think that's good though, because like 40k mm. has the, like big 40k has the issue that every new codex is wildly yeah. good. So I think it's good that Kill Team is releasing stuff that's like mediocre and people have to learn how to play it. And it's not just like all yeah. Over. yeah, I agree. Um, Kasakin is what I'm trying to say. Kachkin. No, not Kachkin. It's K A S R K I N. Kasakin. Okay. It, yeah, it's just... definitely not a fucking real word. Well, most of the stuff in 40k, yeah. as OT yeah. will testify to, aren't real words. <laughs> that, that is that even by 40k sounds about bad as a fake yeah. word. At least make it pronounceable. Or at least so you know how yeah. to pronounce it. Um, but yeah, I, I I think I mean I really want the terrain from into into the dark, and obviously they've released that separately now, so I'll probably get that. Um, but I'm not I'm not interested in the teams at all. And while they're kind of cool, they're I mean the navy breaches, I mean they're a ba they're basically just guards, and anyone who likes guard probably already had like a previous team for them. Um, uh, probably just took the vet guard, and um, anyone who likes the crew, I mean. Crew are kind of cool, I guess, but like you probably wouldn't buy a whole box set for them. Um, whereas I think I th get the feeling maybe a lot of Necron players were waiting to jump on this. Um, and if you're like a, a die, ha die hard Necron fan or Tyranid fan or whatever, the only way to play Kill Team would be with the Compendium. And the Compendium lists for those aren't very good. There's still a few factions that don't have a dedicated team. I know that Tyranids don't have one. And like I said, I imagine a lot of people who play 40k, play one faction, were just waiting for um, a dedicated kill team to come out that they could buy. Um, so the the ter I I imagine that they're not going to miss the opportunity to release either Gene Seer Cults or Tyranids with this current Space Hulk setting. I, I thought Gene Seers would have been like the first thing to yeah. do to do it. To be honest, but it, it, it's got to be coming right. You'd have thought. You'd have thought. I mean, it, it seems yeah. like the easiest thing to have done. Um, but, I mean, they, they've got a Gene Seeder cult um, dedicated kill team, but they're called like something else. They're like the weird hybrid dudes. Oh, yeah. The one that are in White Dwarf, the mm. uh, Worm Blades. Yes. They're, yeah. they're, um, they're in the annual, which I have. Yeah, they, um, they've released them in that. Um, yeah. Anyway, cool. Right. Um, let's quickly do hobby. We, we don't have much to talk about because um, <laughs> I've I've been away. OT's not here, and OT usually does. Usually like, carries us. <laughs> and um, I, I you haven't had much time really to do stuff. So we, we've got very little to talk about. Um, I probably um, will. I throw up some images. I might do. Let's see how interesting it is. So you have. Um, 
you've not painted up like a model, but you've painted up like a piece of scenery, haven't you? Um, yeah, I painted up like a bookend, essentially, that can also be used as a piece of scenery. So uh, there was a bolt, bolt action tournament that I was meant to go to in Bristol last weekend. Did you not go? I didn't go um, oh, because wow. they cancelled it like two days before. Um, yeah. Because uh, only four people were going. <laughs> so, oh, okay. I mean, we still would have all played each other because three games were it, so yeah. it would have worked out. Um, yeah. But I think the guy just, I guess, couldn't be bothered to do it for four people. Um, I guess maybe but... wouldn't have like made money on it, which is fair enough. You know, if you're a store, you've got to make money on it. But yeah. if you're going to be in anyway, I don't know. Just let us come down and play. There's enough people to do the four games, uh, the three games even. Um, so that, that was kind of a shame. Is that because people cancelled on the tournament, or just because bolt action wasn't a big enough draw to get? I think he just going. couldn't get enough people to sign up. Um, it's not like anyone cancelled. And I know that Cheltenham have like a fairly big um, bolt action scene, but a lot of them just couldn't go. So the guy posted afterwards and was like, um, sorry, we cancelled, you know, um, is there anything you'd like to see in the next one that might, um, that you think yeah. would interest more people? So he's got like a proper rules pattern now and um, a lot of people commented like, oh yeah, I'll keep an eye out for the next one. So hopefully there'll be another one. Uh, but I was really looking forward to it, but there it's we It's interesting, um, because Bolt Action is like Warlord's like flagship game, isn't it? I think so. Um, yeah, like, I think so. So it's an interesting struggling for numbers. And we say that like Middle Earth has like a small fan base, but Middle Earth tournaments I think it's never big. struggle no. for numbers, do they? I think they're probably I think the Bolt Action scene, um, they're less interested than in like competitive play and yeah. more just sort of enjoy the hobby whereas i think yeah um there's a lot more community that, in middle earth i guess historical gaming like you're going to get less people wanting to do it at a tournament and more wanting to do it kind of um narrative it's not really narrative is it historical um which is weird because you'd think it'd be the other way around with like lord of the rings no i i kind of get with historical because like well, World War II is probably the only historical period where people will play like pickup games because you can have like small skirmishes which could have taken place. But like if, right. if you if you look at like Napoleonics, I think most people would only really ever play stuff if they're like recreating an actual battle. Yeah, I don't think I don't think that many people will just like throw down two armies unless it's like um, they just want to get a game in. And that's the only person they can play against. I think most people are going to like paint up specific regiments and fight them a uh, specific thing. That that's yeah. the impression I get of it from like the YouTube channels I follow. But I I might be wrong. I think it's just that a lot less people play it as well, which means yeah. there's less diversity in the types of players, let alone the actual player pool. Um, but yeah, so that that was it really for me. Um, I'm hoping you'll say that you painted at least one thing. I haven't painted anything, but I, I have built something um, and done some kit bashing. So um, I posted a photo. Do you remember the little Aragorn I posted? Oh yes, with um, build a yeah. donkey. Not not build a donkey, and it's not <laughs> build a pony. It's a different pony. It's an unnamed, as yet unnamed pony. Basically, um, I am building a fellowship list for a doubles tournament where me and OT are bringing a themed list around um, Aragorn, Arwen, and the Four Hobbits is my force. And then OT is going to bring Elrons and some Riv Knights as the kind of, um, you not know... Not Glorfindel. Not Glorfindel, because uh, you need Elrond to get the bow limit. So it's got to be Elrond, but um, it's it's themed around kind of the hobbits and Aragorn getting across the ford, um, which That's has really cool. Ar Arwen in the um, films, obviously in the books, Wolfendale. But Ar Arwen is part of the fellowship list as per the FAQ, so I can bring her in the same really? war. Yep, um, I did not know that. So but you have to have Aragorn in the list, but obviously that's not makes problem. sense. Yeah. Um, I didn't want to take 
we we kind of undenied because I had points left over um, on my side because Aragorn and the Hobbits were about three hundred. Arwen is about like sixty five of a horse, or is it seventy five, something like that? So we were kind of umming and ahhing as to whether we took um, Aragorn with uh, Andril, which I didn't want to do for law reasons. And then it was kind of Aragorn wasn't really going to do enough work, so then we kind of compromised to take him on horse. But I wanted to uh, do a conversion, so it's not quite thematic because he doesn't have a pony with him, but at least it looks better than him riding around on a horse. So what I've got, and I might have thrown a picture up. If I haven't, people will see it once I paint it because I will throw a picture up once I paint it. But I've got the plastic Aragorn from the um, Fellowship Minds Moria set who I've painted on foot and I have completely reworked his arms and I got a 3D printed pony, um, I think sculpted by Medbury Miniatures, I think. I don't know, I bought it some, from some guy off Etsy for like three pounds with free shipping. Nice. Seems pretty, pretty cheap. Yeah. Um, so I, I've sculpted him so that he's leading the pony and then I've re-sculpted his other arm so that he's holding his sword handle like in a scabbard. But I, I, I'm just going to paint the sword brown rather than wrapping around with sculpting yeah. scabbard. Yeah, um, I thought it was a scabbard looking at it, to be honest. Yeah. And I, I'm pretty happy with it, actually. I'm yeah, not, it's really good. I'm not like a sculptor. This is probably the most extensive sculpting I've ever done because I had yeah. to completely rebuild Aragorn's um, shoulder down to like his um, like lower arm. I had to remove his elbow in the end because the angle didn't work. And it, it doesn't look awful. It doesn't look like it is like his arm is broken. No, I, I, I mean, think the, it, looked, it looked better once you painted it up. Yeah, I don't I think definitely the, would have attempted it. I don't think the proportions are going to be like phenomenal. But I don't think they're bad on that. That's kind of what I'm going for. But I, I think it works out quite well, actually, because he's kind of like looking at the pony. He's like got his hand on the reins, which took forever to <laughs> get like the angle there to glue. Because like I had to like have his arm like going down. So I had yeah. to like glue, glue tack the arm whilst it glued onto the reins. And then I took him off <laughs> his arm and left his arm attached to the pony. And then came back and um, oh God. Used the miller put to attach it. And I had to like pin his hand to his sword because the connection point was so small. So I had to like drill a hole into his hand, drill a hole into the sword. And then I actually used like just a paper clip and just snipped a bit off and then used that to glue the joint. Wow. And then I used the like um, 90 degree angle of the paper clip drilled a hole into his forearm and then I put the paper clip up to where his shoulder is. So that's how I built okay. up his, his shoulder and elbow around that bit of paper clip. So that there was some, there was something there to work on, um, which made that a lot easier. Um yeah, and I've I've undercoated it now today and I, I haven't sent you a photo of it. It looks better now even though I've undercoated it. Um so yeah, I, I don't know if I'll have painted it by next week. Um, it depends if I've got enough time because I've got a few things I've got to do. But I might have done. Um, and I've also um, got Bill the Pony uh, built and undercoated because he's in my list. And I've got Foot and Mounted Arwen undercoated. So yeah, they're, they're going to be painted up at some point and I'll have that list ready. So yeah, I'm really looking forward to the list. Though. I think it's going to be quite fun. We we're we're kind of like unsure as to whether it's going to be. I okay. think it'll be hard to use well. Hard to use well, but two two wrath of Brunans and all of the the cav models, yeah. there is potential for like a very powerful charge turn if we can pull it off. But I think um, some if if we get the wrong um scenarios on the doubles tournament um oh yeah true like there, there's one scenario where basically it's like trying to pick off the um enemy hero isn't there um i can't remember all, all i remember yeah. is 
most of them are all. awful to have to play. If if we get that scenario in that tournament um, where they, you get points for trying to assassinate an enemy hero, we will lose because they'll just pick a hobbit or build a pony and they'll just kill them. But you could just know. hide them at the back of the board, like line them down or go up a tree or something. True, but there's only so much you can do, right? <laughs> yeah, I suppose if you're about to get tabled, there's probably not a lot you can do, but yeah. Um, I think it sounds like an interesting list. Riv Knights are notoriously difficult to play um, well, but I think, I don't know, I think with your joint piloting, you might, you might do all right. Yeah. I've still got I'll, no idea what I'm taking with, with my brother, but we'll see. I'll definitely be giving OT a lot of poking to make sure that he doesn't just... He's, he's going to accidentally measure to be within range of something, what, like, whatever. A, like a bomb compel or whatever. Whatever he did that last weekend where we played, where he just kept on just being unable to kill stuff, I, I'm we're going to make sure. I, he I, do yeah, I don't know what happened. <laughs> I think maybe his dice were pretty bad. His dice were bad. He's got his new Riv Knights dice, so okay, um, maybe that will help. They only roll sixes, as we know, uh, <laughs> the virtual official dice. So that that will definitely help. Good, right? I think we'll move on. Um, our main topic then. Skirmish, wargaming, in the 40k setting. Yes. We're going to talk about... Um, I, I've kind of gone off 40k recently. I used to be much more into it. Um, but lo lots of things have kind of put me off for some reason recently. I've just fell out with it. But you have been really into new kill team, haven't you? I have. Um as I said, much to your disappointment in our group chat, I probably think about it more than Middle Earth SBG because <laughs> I just play it more. I play it every other week probably with one of my colleagues yeah. and um, I've been collecting more and more teams and looking at more and more teams. I know a lot about what the other teams do. It's similar to Middle Earth. like there's, You don't need to learn a lot about your enemy team to understand them. And I think that's one of the big pitfalls of main 40k. So yeah. I like that all these box games are like a microcosm of rules that don't require you to spend, you know, 500 pounds on an army, all that time painting it, and then going to a tournament or just playing anyone and being like overwhelmed by what's going on and all the things they can do and just not being able to, to enjoy it. Um, yeah, and I, I think really what we're going to be having a chat about in today's episode is kind of big, big 40k is, I think, in our opinion, kind of too much at the moment. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of people have been put off it and are turning to smaller games or turning to Age of Sigma because um, it's just a lot. It, it it's getting to the point where they're they're like rules on top of rules on top of rules because they scrapped universal special rules they now have like horrendously worded rules like i don't know yeah. if you saw the, the new because um they started introducing ways to remove invulnerable saves what and like an invulnerable save has always been like you can't alter an invulnerable save yeah but they, but because they had started introducing such powerful and vulnerable saves, they started introducing powerful weapons. But they had to then introduce this kind of idea of a weapon can bypass an invulnerable save. But now <laughs> oh, they started introducing vulnerable saves that can't be bypassed. It's like, oh okay. my god! So the new the new demon codex have like an unmodifiable and vulnerable save because the demons in vulnerable save is now different to regular. Because they're already they're already shit enough. Yeah. But it it's 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 just rule on top of rule on top of rule, and there's so many stratagems, and there's so many armies, and it's just so much. And it basically needs a big reset. But I, I also think there's an element to which um, I, I'm just not interested by um, spending that much money. No, I think committing to like an army mm. is expensive, and it's probably going to be 
you know, if it turns out for whatever reason you don't enjoy playing the army or they get a codex that's shite and makes you not enjoy it or doesn't reflect how the army plays very well, then um, you've you've committed all that money to nothing. I've mm-hmm. got like three, four thousand points worth of orcs fully painted, ready to go in the other room. And I just, I'm just not inter- interested in playing them because yeah, I know that most of the stuff there is rubbish now. Um, I know that mega knobs are kind of okay, and obviously I've got boys, which in theory should be fine. Um, but most of the lists that are doing well at the moment are, are like they use the the squig rider dudes. Yeah, um, yeah, and new course, units gonna favour. And of course, neither of us are kind of you know saying you can't just play with what you've got, and you have to chase like the meta. But I think the issue with big 40k, and it's always been an issue, is that um, if you don't chase the meta, you might end up just playing an army that you never win with. Yeah. Because um, even, even if people don't mean to, they might just have such a vastly better faction than you that it's like you're just playing at disadvantage, even if they deliberately try and bring like a less good army. It's yeah. just better. <laughs> It's so hard to balance a game that has so many like yeah. units and variables and missions. Like, not everyone, not every army, can... and some of them playing the missions than others. Some of them will be like rock paper scissors. I have this thing, yeah. so you're just going to die. Um, and yeah, I just think it's like you said, it's just a lot. It's just a bit too much. And so, skirmish games offer a good route out of that kind of cycle because mm-hmm. um, there's a lot less to manage. Um, it's a lot easier to dip into different factions if you don't like the faction you've got and you want to try something new. And from a rule writing perspective, it's also a lot easier for Games Workshop to manage because they aren't trying to balance. I mean, I there must be hundreds of units in main 40k now they're trying oh, to balance. The, there must be more. I think it if, might if, be in like the thousands. A, it, it, it's kind of ridiculous. But um so kill team then. Um now I played uh kill team was it twenty eighteen that the first one came out? Something like that. Yeah, something like that. Um and at the time we both lived in the East Midlands, so we used to meet up kind of monthly or semi yeah, frequently. And um we go down to uh, Warhammer World. Uh, in the evening after work and we would um, we used to be able to get in like about three or four games because it was super quick um, I had a little Tau kill team <laughs> and then I ended up with um, we got the um, unique ones that they brought out with the Rogue Trader so I took the Geller Fox and you took the um, Star Striders yeah, the Rogue Trader one. And you had a uh, Death Watch, and I think you had like Admech or something, didn't you? Yes. Anyway, I, I really liked that edition. Um, the games were quick. There wasn't that many rules to learn because it kind of felt a bit like 40K, but they'd kind of improved um, how the wound system worked because the issue, there was a much older kill team, which we had played like a couple of times because. The uh, local GW went to um, used to occasionally um, do like things, and I remember playing that, and it was like it didn't really work very well because it, it was literally just forty k, but instead of a unit, yeah. you had a model. Basically, I, I remember. Um, do you remember that guy brought like um, like ten of the Jakairo weaponsmiths? Yes, and yeah. o- ob- obviously that list just won because he would just be like. And now they're using their las cannon mode, and obviously, if you're shooting one las cannon at one dude, that dude yeah. is just going to die. Um, and they they kind of fixed that in 2018 because it had this whole system where um, once you got down to your last wound, you'd like roll a dice, and on a four up, they didn't die, but they took a flesh wound, and like space wounds had a special rule. So it, it kind of fixed that problem. Um, and yeah, I, I enjoyed that. We never got into the expansions. We never got like the elite. We just used to play a hundred points, and um, we didn't really take very competitive lists. And um, I think the only other person I we played was your brother, right? One time, I think. I 
I don't think we did. I don't. Remember. I think I think we did. I think he brought grey knights and he didn't like it. Oh, uh, maybe yeah. Uh, maybe you're trying to get him into it. But yeah, there was also a lot around morale in that. Um, oh, and and that was the most the confusing. We never Every understood. time we looked at it, yeah. So we, we can't none of that ignored it. None of that anymore. Yeah, no morale. the, the morale great. system didn't work massively well. Uh, we didn't really understand it. And there were, were a couple of hangovers from main 40k that they've now got rid of, like weapon ranges, where it's like, in reality, like most weapons can fire across the entire board. But now now it's like, unless it's a pistol, you can just hit everything, which is a good change. Yeah. Uh, but I have not transitioned into new kill team. And I think for me, the reason why I haven't is because um, I feel like they've taken away some customization. And I feel like it's... In reality, the customization is still there, and really, I'm being overly pedantic. <laughs> um, and I think, for balance reasons, um, what they've done has improved it because it's like you take 12 guys, that's your kill team, and you pick which operative it is. So the customization comes from picking the operatives. The issue I have is it's a kind of like, why would you ever pick the normal guy if you can pick a guy with a better weapon? So clearly there isn't, like the customization to me feels like a bit of a, like veneer over the so, top. Yeah, it is to an extent, but it also helps balance things quite a lot because Games sure. Workshop can balance it knowing yeah. you're going to take certain things. So in the compendium, it's like um, you can take uh some of them it's you can take one fire team and then it tells you what a fire team is for that faction some of them it's yeah. you can take two fire teams and it, it'll have like two two or three op uh, different fire teams you can take for example the orc one um can take uh, essentially boys commandos um or like specialists you can take like uh five boys or uh five commandos or four specialists it's something like that obviously the specialist is slightly my, better to make up my understanding man. though is right that most people like try and avoid playing the compendium teams that they can and it's better to play the custom yeah. built ones and there's like a but slight the, differential yeah, so like in the custom power. ones are pretty much always better mm. um, because they just have more rules because when they were writing the compendium i think they just thought how can we let people play these yeah. um but I think maybe they knew in their heads, actually, we're going to release something that's like yeah. this, but we don't want it to be worse than this because otherwise no one will use it. So, um, yeah, but you're right. But I mean, the, even, even the, so the rogue trader ones, for example, so your Galapox and my dudes, the star striders, um, there is no customization. You, no. you use every figure that's in the box and, yeah. uh, no more, no less. That is your force. The Galapox is a bit different in the, and then like a couple of small, the the normal um, plague bearer type dudes, and then you can spend they equipment like points. They like the chaff, don't they? Yeah. So you, well, sort yeah. of. You can spend equipment points. So everyone has ten equipment points. At the end of their thing, they've got a se selection of equipment that they can use. And the uh, Galapox, you can spend your equipment points on the Gribbo dudes, on the little flies or whatever it is, um, and that can add some customization. You can customize with. Obviously, the equipment. So, for example, at the beginning of a game, if I'm playing the Pathfinders, I can give some guys grappling hooks if there are bits of terrain I want to go on. I can give some of them marker lights if I need to like light up more dudes. I can give them um, you know, various different things based on my what my opponent has and what the terrain is, which is quite good. Um, and for example, so for the for the Pathfinders, um, pretty much every faction has a really basic this is the infantry model and it doesn't have any special rules obviously with the pathfinders there are like nine other operatives that do have tend to take those first and then you've yeah. got the drones and the recon drone but um there are maybe 15 different options there but you only have space to take essentially 12 and um so you're never going to be able to take everything and that's where some of the customization comes in um yeah but um yeah sure it it, it is a bit less customization um and they have tried to balance it. For example, your sergeant, you can't just give him the two best weapons anymore. It used to be that, obviously, I can just give him you know, a plasma pistol and a power sword because yeah. they're really good. Um, but now, yeah, so now it's 
you can take the plasma pistol, but you have to take a chainsaw with it. Or you sure. can take the power sword, but you have to take the bolt pistol with it. So um, it does allow them to control the balance a lot more. And from what I've seen, their aim is to keep the win rate for all the factions between 45 and 55%. And for the most part, they're succeeding. They're trying to tighten it down because there are some outliers, some like blatant outliers, and there are things they should do and probably could do very easily to fix these. But um, overall, I I don't think I can ever see myself playing 40k over kill team because I can just collect so many factions and a uh, big investment. Yeah. Um, I can change up play styles really easily if I want to. I can introduce people to it without having to say, by the way, you're going to have to take out a second mortgage if you want to play with me. Um, it's it's just I love it. Yeah. And the, the interesting thing is, and we'll, because we'll be talking about the other skirmish games in a second, but the idea behind Kill Team used to be that it was like you got into Kill Team and then it would lead into 40k, which is different to the sure. other uh, skirmish games. But like you're saying, this new Kill Team doesn't feel like that. It feels more like its own thing rather than um, sharing similarities with 40k. And it does now kind of feel like they are starting, to, like the kits, from a sales perspective, they give them 40K rules so that they can sell it to the 40K crowd. But it does now feel like um, they're not really thinking about it in terms of um, feed it. Yeah. Like it we, we, yeah, we were talking in the um, other episode, they're now releasing essentially um, rules for what was Kill Team like, 10 years ago which is smaller games of 40k so yeah. they're now going to have a rule system where you slap two of these kill team boards together with the indoor terrain for space alt and you play 500 points of 40k on those so it sounds like that is replacing the idea of a the smaller feeding. game yeah. that feeds in and then kill teams now its own thing which i think is a, a good idea um the the only i think the thing that's I think the customization thing I've now come to accept that like that was just an initial reaction on my part, and that actually it's not as bad as I thought, and that actually I, I can still have my little special snowflakes and build them the way I want, like I could be old kill team. I think the thing that's now put me off is I mean, one, it's just I'm I just can't really be bothered with 40k at the moment. I think I think I'm just kind of like I, I want to break from it for a while. Like proper 40k um, or the general 40k, just like the universe. I think. Yeah, I think I, I'm just kind of like, I've I've always been more of a fantasy person than a sci-fi person. But I think the other thing is, I think I prefer slightly more sandboxy games. And I think this is very rigid. Yeah, I mean, it is more rigid than say. Um, the equivalent 500 point 40k game where it's like you know you have a lot more options what you're going to take as a it, faction it's not even options i think it's just like i think i just prefer games where it's a little less competitively minded and i think this 40k is very um this kill team is very focused on balance and yeah. make like for, like my i i've seen like memes about like the um who can shoot who if like optives are like on certain parts of terrain and i get that oh, it yeah, makes like, a a it makes like a fantastically like balanced game where you can really like think about it but i think i just prefer like stuff like in middle earth where it's just can they see them yes okay well rather than us spending like ages like making a really complicated rule system let's just say you just have to roll a four up to get past the thing that's in the way and yeah. i think i just prefer the slightly more streamlined and it's a little less kind of worrying about the it's less gamey yeah yeah, yeah. I, yeah so I, I think i just prefer that kind of attitude of a game which just has like a simple thing of don't really worry about it just roll a dice and then that just answers your question rather than the whole like right if you're within one inch and this person can see you but they yeah, can't yeah. shoot you but you can see that and I think that that just puts me off. I think I'm just like, oh, I just really can't be bothered with a game. There's like that. 
a really good example of what you're saying. And it's it happened in a game the other day. Um, so it, there's, a, there's a pillar, uh, and then behind that pillar is a guy, like sticking out halfway from the pillar. And then behind that guy is another guy who's half obscured by the first guy and half in the open. Uh, FAQ'd it, technically, you could just line up guys like that infinitely and they'd all be in cover because you can use another person as cover. But the next person along is hiding behind the next person and then the yeah. end guy is hiding in cover. But now they've done it. So either um, you can either hide behind that uh, a guy who's in... Um, you can either hide behind a guy, but then that guy can't be hiding behind a second guy essentially so they 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 like faq'd it but you could also do a thing where because um what you're doing is you pick a point on your guy's base and then you draw a line of sight from any point on your base to the left and right hand side of the uh, opponent's base and if if there's any terrain piece that interferes with that line they're in cover so essentially you'd only have to be like 0.1 of a millimetre behind a piece of terrain. Uh, well, actually, only 0.1 of a millimetre of your base has to be behind a piece of terrain. So where, for example, on some of the terrain pieces, you've got like a straight wall, but there's half a pillar sticking out. And it's it's literally like three mil worth of pillar. But if you get a guy behind there, suddenly your opponent's model has to be like right next to your guy. Otherwise, they can't see them. And there are a couple of instances where essentially yeah. that happened. So every time I move a guy somewhere like that, I'm like, to my opponent, and so I, I you can have to come here. I can understand from a rule design's perspective because the whole th this is the whole question of should you treat your model as like a static game piece or should we treat it more as that's where the person is and yeah. we're assuming that they're crouching down and using cover because the yeah, yeah. philosophy of the kill team is is that well this is where they are but just because the model is sculpted standing up and waving his chainsaw in the air obviously <laughs> he's not gonna be doing that for the entire battle so we yeah. just assume that he's crouched behind his pillar but That's again exactly it's like it, yeah. it's just like a kind of thing where i'm just like just just make it easier just there are some say, say it's just I mean, roll it just do it like middle earth just roll a four up yeah the, the cover so, rules are quite yeah. complicated um yeah. but once you get your head around it it's kind of okay but it's that initial classic yeah. games workshop way of writing it where you're like oh the rules read that are, four times the you know? rules are written horrendously when i try to read them like i kill kill team is one of the few games where i can watch like a battle report on youtube and i just don't understand what's happening and i feel like yeah. that's kind of the issue um yeah so that that's kill team and yeah. I, I, I realize it has like its audience and that it's a good game, but it's just not interesting to me. The the other main skirmish game they do then is Necromunda, which is kind of like I love the models. The, the the models are awesome. It's kind of like the opposite of Kill Team. It's like really narrative. You're meant to play it as a campaign because, like, the whole system is built around your guys are meant to improve, and it's a bit like Blood Bowl, like that. You're, you're like, it, it's better if you do it as a campaign. Um, and rather than kill teams like the Spec Ops, the like best of the best, and the Neck Fund is just like a load of blokes and yeah, blokes some just types. like random like women with mohawks who just live in like a slum. And they fight over resources because they live in a horrible world. Um, yeah, and they've recently released this whole like um, expansion where you—it's basically like Mad Max, the expansion. So yeah. basic Necromunda is like you're fighting in corridors, a bit like the the new Kill Team, I guess. You're fighting in corridors, and um, you you have all of your little guys. And then the new expansion is they're out in the um, wasteland. And they've got a really cool new um, team, which look like the Tuscan Sand Raiders. The Ash Waste Nomads. And they have like the guys on like the really big like fleas. Yeah. They're awesome. Cool. Like I, I would love to paint some, but I have no purpose for them. I also no. really like the uh, squats for Necromunda. Yeah, they're pretty cool. I actually think I prefer them to the 
forty um, k squats. Okay ones. Yeah, they look yeah, a little like, bit like the um, you know the the dudes in Doctor Who that have that like yeah the war- with the dudes. with the like massive dome heads. They do don't yeah. They? They're, like that. They're, they're, they're a bit derpy but I think I kind of like the derpiness they're not so derpy that they're like ridiculous, ridiculous yeah. but they, they, feel, they feel a bit more dwarfy don't they yeah they do it, I think it's the the hammers like they, and the um... they feel more um, like they feel like they have a lower centre of gravity whilst the, yeah. the the 40k dwarfs actually kind they're of look like space marines they look like small space marines, yeah. Yeah, I like that these guys have like um like moon suits, like yeah. they're like properly like, and they've got like the got air huge backpacks as well. Yeah, yeah, I I I really like massive for them. So like, I I think I would like be much um. I think like model wise, I'd much rather jump into the next Monda, and they've got like an incredible like plastic range, like they've dedicated so much. The issue of Necromunda um, is that you have to own like a billion books, from what I understand. Oh, right. So I, I think every different um, every different oh, warband sure. in Necromunda, I think, has its own book. So I've just I'm looking through the GW website, and I've just got to the part where there's like literally like ten books on my page. Yeah. So like all of the different houses are like. Um, the different war bands but obviously classic gw i don't think that they just sell you the rules i think that they also throw in extra stuff in each book as a reason for you to buy it if you don't run it so that everyone gets something which sounds like a good idea until you realize that gw are then going to release 10 books so <laughs> like for example i've just clicked on um the book of the outcast Okay. So the book of the outcast includes um, all the rules you need to know in order to field an outcast gang in skirmish and narrative games of Necromunda. But then it also includes hangers on and brutes. It includes rule for hiring hangers on and brutes. Oh, Outland really. All the all the terrain rules needed to establish a stronghold for Necromunda gangs. Uh, weird powers Ugh. like at the end of the hive with rules for weird, I guess they're psychic powers and force weapons. Uh, Outland com- campaigns embark on a narrative campaign to build and grow a settlement. So, like, th- this is the issue that um, I think Necromunda has is that if, if that book was just this is your book for running that gang, yeah, then it, it's just a codex, but it's not. It's like, okay. I'm if building play this uh, element of the game. Yeah, I, I'm building a squat list, but my friends want to run a narrative campaign where we build the um, we uh, grow a settlement, which is a cool idea because the whole like they've released um, a plastic terrain set, the uh, zone mortalis underhive market, and like you can raid each other's stuff and you can represent. I think what you've upgraded your base with with this terrain set, awesome really cool and it's not actually too bad for gw plastic train it's like 32 pound 50 and you get quite a lot for it but i now have to buy a 30 pound book to play that campaign with them and you might just get a gang a lot of gang rules that you don't want as well and what if i play the um the house of iron and i have to now buy that 30 pound book and i'm i'm guessing the house of iron comes with uh warlock gang list but then it also comes with hired guns for bounty hunters okay so if i if i play a different thing if i want a bounty hunter i now have to buy this book but then i want to play with my friends who are doing this thing where we build up our base so i've now got 23 books yeah it's like oh uh, this is like a like necromunda would it would be i think this should be like where they try all doing online rules and see if it works. Or just like free like, online rules. Just do like free online rules like they've done with um or or like get people to pay like ten pounds a year. Cause I feel like for if like this is one of those things where if they built like an app that worked rather than the horrible shit that they've tried to put out so far, like for a narrative game, like something which tracked all of your stuff and had all the rules, people would pay ten pounds a year for that. 
they'd probably pay more. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And if, if like, I could pay that to like just play, you know, Kill Team or Forty K, I probably would. I think everyone would, and they'd make so much more passive income rather than having to spit out like these codexes because they they're now getting print anything either. They're now getting to the point where they have to release codexes so quickly to keep updating everything and to keep people buying that it's like just if you just said to everyone pay us 30 pound a year and we will just give it all to you and you don't have to track it and you just pay someone who's built one of the fan ones which is so much better to just own the fan one to be honest but and anyway yeah. so um necromunda really cool I think it's like an awesome idea. I think that the models, the scenery, just everything about it is awesome. Um, I, I don't think that I would get into it though for those reasons. I think it's just, it's like, a, it's just a rabbit hole. But I think if you wanted to seriously play it, it would start off being you buy a 30 pound box and a bit of terrain, and then it would become a, I have to own a small library to play. Yeah, and I think that that might like some people will probably love that, um, but I like the fact that, for example, in Kill Team, I I don't I mean everyone just has a rule book, and maybe a faction book that came with their box, yeah, set, and that's basically it. And the the only the only thing you need for Kill Team is if you want to play in this new um, you play inside the yeah Space Hulk thing, you just need to get like the updated version of the. Space hot rules, don't you? There, there is and the equivalent of a campaign is, in Kill Team as well. Yeah, but I think that's a better way of doing it. And I think the Necromunda would have done better to not have split the rules up into so many different books. Um, yeah, Net. It's also, I think, like, I think the issue with Necromunda as well is because it's so narrative based. If you've got like a group of people together, and one person literally just wants to spend. 30 pounds on their thing and own two books like there's going to come a point where if other people want to do other stuff like you get like an issue of like including the group like i think everyone has to be on board with yeah. like e everything because like imagine you wanted to get into the ash wastes suddenly you need a bigger board size you need outdoor terrain the factions then have outdoor stuff that you need because you have vehicles and it's it's like it as soon as like half your gaming group wants to play that and the other half don't, it's just gonna Yeah. Bite. I mean maybe if like if your gaming group, you know, maybe there's four of you, you just all agree over the next six months that you're gonna buy all the books between you and then you've got yeah. like a shared library. That I mean maybe that's the way you play it because then you're also probably, really encouraged to do it. It's probably the way to do it, especially if everyone has a different gang. Like, if you had enough people that everyone had a different gang, then you'd own all the books collectively, wouldn't you? Yeah, and that, that could to. that could resolve the issue. Although, as, as we know from um, Middle Earth, like, eventually it becomes a bit tedious, doesn't it? Like, saying, "Can you send me a photo of this?" and you just end up buying the book anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this is true. I mean, maybe yeah. how do how do the ebook versions work? Like, could I could we like theoretically you, you do that? Can, you can get ebook versions. The issue is, is that they are not that cheap. Not shareable either. They're basically so, the same price, um, from what I remember. Yeah. So the Necromunda e oh, actually, they are quite a bit cheaper. I take it back. The Necromunda ebooks are seventeen pounds rather than. Um, 30 pounds almost so at, price. actually take it back i didn't realize that they were significantly cheaper um so that that is one solution but yeah i'm not sure if you can swap them around i feel like it's a you download it once and then your code expires kind of deal but i i guess that's one way of doing it but then obviously you need something to read them on because your phone's not the best thing to be reading the because Games Workshop ebooks are not designed for phones. Like you will be, are they not? You will be presented with tiny little text because it, it's just a PDF basically in the book. Oh, brilliant! Yeah, brilliant. Even Wikipedia, which I've taken to using quite a lot for Kill Team, is so good. Like I, can, yeah, it's so good. And it's it like good. has like the thing where you can like highlight over a rule and it just pops up what it is. Yeah, it's really good. Which which is what 
I think Games Workshop need to do um, at some point. So those are kind of the, the main two then. Um, and it leaves us with, I, I'm calling them Skirmish Games, Aeronautica Imperialis and Adeptus Titanicus. Um, I think they probably class as Skirmish Games. I, I think they are. Um, let's start off with Adeptus Titanicus. Okay. This is like a skirmish game for rich people. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you, you need to buy a board that's as big as a 40k board and um, you, are, you only need about five models, but each one is like 80 pounds. Here we go. <laughs> Why are they so expensive? They're not even that big, are they? They're ma like, um, you know, the, uh, the Warmaster. The war hound. What? The if, if you if you have a look, so you've got the uh, Titan, so you've got the Reaver, the War Hound, and then there's that War Master that's a hundred quid. Yeah, I can see the War Master that's hundred quid, but like, th aren't these all like quite small models? They're they're eight mil size. That War Master is about the size of a Imperial Knight in forty k. Okay, so the cost does sort of so scale. Oh. Cost it's a little wise, bit more expensive. It feels like there's a tax. It's it's no, it's actually the same as an Imperial Knight, if not cheaper. Is it? Oh well, there you go. An Imperial Knight is let's just quickly find it uh, because the Imperial Knights have like got wildly more expensive. So an Imperial Knight is a hundred quid now. Okay, so so it's the same. It's the same, and I think arguably it's a nicer model in terms. I of really detail. like it. It's got so much um, detail. And then if you if you have a look, so the Warhound Scout Titans, they're about the same size as a um like Sentinel. So again, yeah. two, two for forty quid. quid. Yeah. They're not that bad. And then the Reef is like a little bit bigger than that. So you know you've got that. Because if you look at the base size, um the the little Warhounds come on uh, 80 mil rounds. So they're they're quite big. Um but yeah, you've you've got to own a few, so you are looking at chunk. It mm. actually has a very reasonably priced um, star set. Yeah. So if you look at the star set, you get two of the Reavers, two of the Warhounds, and two of the Knights for 100 quid. If you were to buy all of those um, separately, I think it comes to about 100 quid. So you're basically getting everything other than the models for free, which isn't too bad. And obviously, you can get that discounted 20% off somewhere like Wayland. So actually, for a star set, that's not that bad. Yeah. Uh, if, oh, no. if you look actually, at it I from... lie, it's even cheaper because a um, Reaver's thirty six, so that would be um, seventy two plus the Warhounds forty two. So you you are you are saving loads on the star set, and at that point, you split that between two people. You probably only need to buy like one of the expensive big titans, and you're probably done. So we're backtracking on it being. A game for a rich. It, it's it's definitely a game for rich people compared to like Kill Team. Like you, you've wow. also got to deal with the issue of you've got to buy some eight millimeter terrain. Yeah, it doesn't come with um, any terrain, does it? It doesn't come with any terrain. The terrain you can get some. I mean, fifty quid for like two of these boxes is pretty good. Yeah, you can get the little warlords as well, which are. Um, they're slightly smaller than knights, and they're about sixty-seven pound fifty. So, I, I'm I'm being a little bit um, a little bit of hyperbole, perhaps saying it's a, a skirmish game for rich people. I don't think it's as expensive, perhaps, as everyone thinks it is. But it, it's it's definitely not one of the cheaper skirmish games. Like you, you're looking at kind of an investment somewhere probably around what you're doing for like Middle Earth. Like it's cheaper than. It's cheaper than 40k, but it's definitely more expensive than their other skirmish games. I don't know if this is a hot take, but I don't think it's a very interesting setting. What, the... Um... Just Titans killing Titans. They might. I mean, I know they're meant to be big, but they might as well be, you know, like mice fighting each other amongst grass, like yeah. blades of grass. Like, I don't... Really there's no scale. Weird. The really weird thing for me is that they set it during the Horus Heresy. Yeah, why not set it in 40k where there's like way more stuff? You could have stompers. Yeah, you could make it basically ep ep in. epic 40k. Yeah. Well, uh, there's a lot of rumours going around that it's going to become epic 40k and that this right. was because they, when we talk about Aer Aeronautica Imperialis, they scaled it the same size as this. 
So they've left the door open to okay. it. But it, it is interesting that they went, yeah, let's just keep it Horace Heresy, which I guess helps in terms of you are selling mm. everything to everyone. I like, wonder if it's uh, the same night. Because this way, they if they've kept it separate from 40k, they can still make Epic 40k and make yeah. it something separate. Whereas, yeah. I think generally there's less interest in Horus Heresy than 40k anyway. So, yeah, just make a little night game over there, that's fine. And then they're like, okay, night game was okay, and people like that. Let's make Epic 40k now. Yeah, um, presumably this was to gauge interest in whether that skill would be something people are into. And supposedly this, from what I've heard, this sells actually okay. Yeah, I've heard similar. And I, I don't know whether that's because people are playing it or whether because people are like, well, I really want a Warlord's Titan, but I'm not paying like £3,000. So but I, I could, for Christmas, afford one for £70. <laughs> and, you know, I, I won't be able to use my games at 40k, but it'll look nice on the shelf. I imagine that they make quite a lot of sales from people doing that. But um, yeah. I, I don't... I, 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 I guess there's a niche market of people who like the idea of big, stompy robots punching each other. And um, from what I hear, the rules are quite cool. Like, you can, a bit like in old 40k, you can, like, destroy weapons and, like, the reactors can melt down. So you only have, like, about five models to keep track of. So they each come with these little punch board cards, which you, like, have pins in. Yeah. And it's like very kind of like you're like managing all of your little oh well if I overcharge the reactor my knight might not be able to go next turn but I can like destroy the enemy potentially so from from what I hear it's it's um it's not as bad as I think some people think it is I think this game has like a lot of haters it does sound interesting and I like the you know yeah that sort of it's almost like you're piloting it and you've got to think about all these different things and um yeah yeah it's a bit um, like war machine i don't know if you've heard about war machine i know a little bit about war machine um it's best not to look at the uh forge world prices for this game if you want some of the more specialists oh they're forge world ones yeah the the most um egregious of the forge world ones is the uh you know, it, the, for the Imperial Knights, they have the little knights, the armagers and the Helverins. You know those? Uh, yes, I'm looking at them now. Uh, on Forge World, you can get them in 8 mil scale, £35 for three. Yeah, that's pretty bad. I mean, they look really cool, though, to be fair. They look really cool, but have you seen how big the base size is? Are they twenty five mil bases? Twenty five mil. Jesus. Those, those, you're you're basically buying like a model that's like a Hobbit sized model for like eleven quid. For like eleven quid, and you can't get Forge World at a discount. And when you think about how much an actual um, armager is, an actual armager comes in a box of two for fifty two pound fifty. And that's but at it's only 20, like twice the price. That's at twenty eight mil scale, and you can get that reduced. So if I go on to Wayland, let's have a look at how much they're on Wayland. And that's full plastic poseable. Um, you know, you you can you can do whatever you want with it. Wayland, they're selling them for thirty seven pounds seventy seven for two. So basically, the same price. It, well, for, it, for it's, two it's, basically, it's, basically, it's basically an option of you pay two pound more from Wayland and you get two, which are going to be like, Proper you know, scale. twenty mil, like bigger than a Sentinel, like quite chunky. And that's actually, you know, you're probably one night away then from like a forty k army, like a small forty k yeah. army, or yeah. you can spend the same price and get three tiny ones, which are like such an insignificant. Um, part of the uh, Adeptus Titanicus game that they basically are, they don't really do anything. They're just kind of there to be a little distraction. Um, yeah, it, I think you've got to stick to the plastic stuff that Games Workshop have made and ignore the Forge World stuff. They must be making an absolute bomb on those. Like, that's ridiculous. I, I can't believe many people nothing. 
I've I've only ever seen about three on Reddit that have been painted. Yeah. I don't I I don't think that they can have sold very well. It seems crazy they wouldn't just make them in plastic. You'd have thought they'd just all they need is like a small sprue, and you could just pop three on, and you just then sell them for like you know, six for 25 quid, and suddenly I imagine that loads of people would buy them, but yeah. Yeah. I'm quite interested to see what um, this flying game is, because I know that you've got some models for it. Yeah, I do. So let, let's move on then. So this is actually the game that I think I would be most likely to do for 40k. Um but it's really, really weirdly done by Games Workshop. So, um, Aeronautica Imperialis, um, they have released three box sets for this with the rule book in each one, but they never release the rule book separately and the box sets are always limited runs. So there's no, there's no start box. They have re-released the rule book, but only in a Horus Heresy version, and it's currently out of print, and they're doing a reprint for it. Um, so it's <laughs> it's basically impossible to get the rules for this game. But weirdly, <laughs> I, I, I like whoever's designed this is a madman. They've made like ev pretty much everything in plastic, other than a few like niche stuff. So like, look at the space marines. You can get the Thunderhawk in plastic. A Fire Raptor gunship, the uh, Interceptor Squadron, and the Storm Eagle Squadron, all plastic sprues. Like they, they're investing money into this game and then they make it so difficult to play. The Eldar have the Nightwings and the Phoenix. The Orcs have all of these like Grot bombers. The Tau have um, like fighters, bombers, like the Imperial Navy have like five types of like fighter. How like big are these meant to be? They're quite thing. small, aren't they? They're they're eight mil. So like the Thunderhawks actually pretty chunky, but that's enormous. But they're they're like about you know probably a couple of inches across wingspan. Some of them. Okay, that's fairly really big small. then. They're 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 bigger than you think, and the bases they come on are actually quite complicated because they have little dials in. So yeah. I suspect the price probably comes from the dials. This is probably the most affordable game Games Workshop do at the moment. Really? Well, you don't need any scenery. What's the box set cost? The bo If you can get a hold of one of the box sets, you can pick them up for between 50 and 60 quid, which come wow. with a, good. A, a cheap paper mat, which you're probably going to want to swap out. And it comes with a big enough force that you could just play with them. In reality, if, if you want to get into this game, you need two boxes. You need a box of bombers and a box of fighters, and you're done. Because I don't I think... I mean, there's not a big model range, is there? I, yeah, I don't think people play this at very big points cost. So let's say you're playing um, the Imperial Navy. You'd buy a box of the Lightning Fighters and a box of the Marauder Bombers, and you can you can play with just that. Do you think this is GW's answer to X-Wing? I think it is. Um, it's different to X-Wing because it's on hexes. I, I think that was the intention. But obviously, X-Wing has kind of um, not disappeared, but it's definitely not as popular as it was back in the day. So I wonder if GW kind of came out with this but didn't really want to fully invest. So they're willing to put out the plastic models mm. and invest, but they haven't really decided what to do with it. I, I just think, though, what a weird thing to do to make all of this in plastic and then not bother to, like, properly create, like, rule books. Like, some of these models, the only ways to get the rules are the little, um, just the rules that come in the box, just on the back of the instruction kits. Like, how wow. bizarre. That is weird. So strange. So a, a lot of these, the only way you can get the rules now is to get the ebook version. I mean, maybe but, maybe it just kind of flopped, and they were like, mm, "Let's just leave that." Why know. did they? Why have they kept going though? Are they still making stuff for it? Yeah, like oh. the the um, the Eldar and the um, Space Marines came out this year. Oh, the fuck! 
This game confuses me. But if it bombed, like, why didn't they just stop with the orcs and the navy? And I guess that there's a lead up time in design. But if if it bombed, why then come out with a third box set with the Eldar on the Space Marines? Because surely they wouldn't have started designing those like four years ago when this originally started coming out. Like well, they I mean, they, they, they have stopped. the models already. Like they've got the CAD files. Like they just have to make it smaller and then chunk sure. chunkify them a bit. Um, well, the the models are really nice. Like the detail on these little models is fantastic. That's they're like perfect little miniature recreations. Mm. They are like absolutely beautiful models. Like I own the um, Grot Bombers, which yeah, is like cool. I love them. I haven't painted them up yet because I, I kind of haven't got round to finishing my epic stuff that I was building that I got before. And I also own the Thunderhawk, which. Um, I just haven't bothered because I need to paint it as Black Templars, and I'm kind of looking at it thinking, oh, I've either got to edge highlight all of those panels, <laughs> or it's the look so I can't be bothered. But I, I would love to play this game, and I think you could do it really cheaply, and I'd probably do like some Valkyries, because I've always wanted a Valkyrie, and it's like, if you get them from Wayland, it's like you get four little Valkyries for 22 quid. Which ones are the Valkyries? They're the like little Imperial Guard ones, the ones that like okay. are the hover hover jets with the like. Oh, why am I tempted to invest in the orcs? But like, like it, I like the heavy bomb, the um, uh, the grot bombers look really fun. The little the little uh, pods, they're really fun to build. In the rules, like they are like a little guided missile that like you fly yeah. around constantly until they connect with something, and then it just like blows up. Um, I I just feel like all this game would need is like a little bit of attention, love, and care, and they'd actually be able to like get people going. They hold tournaments for this game in Warhammer World. I mean, they, they must they, sell tickets for them, I guess. Yeah, yeah, they they do, and uh, people go, but like they never mention it. Otherwise, the only time they mention it is to sell new stuff, and then it like disappears again. Yeah, it's, it's never just, on Warhammer Community, is it? It's just, I, this is what I don't get about GW sometimes, the difference in the way they release things. Because this is kind of why I wanted to have this chat whilst OT was away, just to kind of look at some 40k stuff, talk about it, but then also compare. Kill Team gets the very regular box sets. I understand the release system. It attracts interest because you release these things quarterly. It makes people think the game is alive. Aeronautica, people don't get into it. I see posts on the Reddit saying, should I get into this? And people are like, well, it kind of feels like it's dead because they don't give it support. And yet there's a massive plastic range. The only the only two factions which um, aren't plastic and you have to go Forge World are the Necrons and the um, Custodes. And the Necrons only have two flyers and the Custodes only have one. So they're not really like massive factions everything else you can build completely using these plastic kits and you don't need to dip into board world just really bizarre so I'm, I'm looking that. on the uh, warhammer community and i just searched for aeronautica whatever it is um i mean they I'm, I'm surprised that there's anything but they're they've essentially mentioned it a few times when they've released stuff but only in the midst of like a load of other stuff there is one dedicated one dedicated article from not too long ago, oh, yeah. yeah, with the like that shows the shadow bird, the red hunter from the world eaters, like the really cool, like little. So, um, so the the last dedicated posts were one in August about the new Legion upgrades. Then you have to go back to July to basically announce the release of that book. Back in May, they said that they released something in Forge World for the Custodes. And then uh, back in April, which is when they released the newest um, plastic kits and all of the stuff at the beginning of the year in February and January, where they did the Space Marines, um, Eldar, and the Necrons. Yeah. But then, yeah, just that that's all they've mentioned this year. So they, they put out, uh, over the last year, they've put out um, two, two Forge Worlds Eldar kits. Two forge, uh, no, three forge, four forge worlds Eldar kits because they released like a load of little ones. Two forge world Necron kits, 
afford Royal Custodies kit. Uh, they've released uh, two net, uh, two Eldar plastic kits, four Space Marine plastic kits, and yet you can't buy a starter box anymore from Games Workshop. The only dedicated rules book you can buy is Waiting a Reprint, and it's specifically for the Horus Heresy. So if you want to play anything that's not Space Marines or Imperial Navy, you have to use the rules that come on the back of the instruction guides. What a bizarre game. Yeah. I mean, not being able to get your hands on like a physical rule book is pretty horrendous. Why do they keep investing money in it and then deliberately killing it? Just just release a thirty pound rule book that contains all of the rules and just slap it out there. Why would you decide to release that as specifically the Horus Heresy, so you can only play two of the factions you release. What? I feel I, like I, we must be missing something, but I No, I can't no see we're, we're not, we're not, because I, I, I am like, I would love to play this game, so I actually like keep an eye on it, and ev everyone's so confused about it, like everyone's like, this game is bizarre. You can get the, you can get the core cool rule books as EPUB, so you can see, you can get the, um, Imperial Navy and um, Orcs and the Imperial Guards and Tau, those EPUBs have the core cool rules in. Okay. Um, they, for some reason, haven't done an EPUB for the Eldar rules, so there's currently no way of getting the Eldar rules. Or, and you can get the Necron rules in the um, Companion, and then you can get the Space Marine rules in the only rule book they sell, which is the Horus Heresy book. And I guess if you want to play Horus Heresy, you are you just need that book, you need a mat, and you need a couple of boxes of the Space Marines, and you're good to go. That's all you need. I, I, I would like to play this game at some point. Um, I think I'll struggle to find people to play it with, to be honest. I'm looking at the Orc 1 Mega Bomber on Forge World. <laughs> it looks it's super cool. ludicrously big, that model. It's got so many bombs on it. Yeah. Wow, but the the um the scenarios for that game are really like interesting. It's kind of all about like um, some scenarios will be one team is like trying to bomb the other team's base, so it's like very asymmetrical, which GW yeah. doesn't do a lot. So it's it's more des it's more designed around the idea of you play a scenario twice, one time as the attacker, one time as the defender. Okay. And you're like trying to see who can do it better. Makes it balanced, I suppose. So like one one team will like try and bomb, and then you have like scenarios where you're trying to like para sh like shoot troops down. So one team will have to take planes that have troop capacity, so they might not be as good, and then the other team will just be able to take pure like fighters to shoot them down. So it's actually got like a really asymmetrical game type. I actually read the rule pack for um the rule pack for the official um, tournament they're doing at Warhammer World, and they, in the rule pack, tell you to bring two lists. And yeah, you can- one for attack and one for defending. You can you choose which list before you start you're gonna bring. So you can bring your list, which is really focused on like air fighting, and then you can bring your list, which is really focused on bombing and doing like the troop um, flying. Yeah. And then depending on the style, yeah, you, you, you pick that. Yeah, I think that makes um, sense because yeah. you're you're gonna gear like if if you're a flying army, you're not gonna like gear up with all fighters if you're gonna try and bomb someone with base or you know vice versa. Yeah, and I think the board size you play on is um, how big is it? Three foot by three foot. I, I just feel like it would get so much more interest if they actually gave it attention and acted like it was a real game and didn't ignore it. It's yeah. the most ignored game that they make. I just, I just don't understand it. I think it looks very really interesting. It, it, could, it could be the 40k version of uh, Warhammer Underworld, which is like really popular and like has like a card yeah. and it has like a card game mechanic as well and like they sell incredibly well, like those War um, Warhammer Underworlds things, and like, but it just isn't. So I don't know. 
There you go. I think it'd be nice, you know, if they release a box, that'd be nice. Uh, or just the fucking rule book. <laughs> or just the, the rule book. I mean, if, if you if you search on um, eBay, you can pick them up pretty easily. And if you look at some, there are still some online stores that have the like Eldar versus okay. base me box set. So you, you can shop around and pick stuff up. Um, but yeah, really odd. But I I probably will, I think, next year build a force for no reason other than that I want to paint the little Astra Militarum um, Valkyries and Vendetta warships. You're not going to go Orcs, so I can I can get a dibs on Orcs then? No. I mean, you've I, already got a bomber, haven't you? I do, I do have the uh, Grot Bombers, which uh, um, I'm not mounting on the bases that I'm going to put them on epic bases. And that's why I've also with the Thunderhawk. So, um, yeah, uh, I, I, I'd go in guard, I think. Do the cool, yeah, that'd I'll be with my orcs then. And they, they do little, um, you can get little, um, anti air guns to put on hexes on the ground. I saw, yeah, yeah. they're really cool. So, the orcs and the imperial navy have like a plastic one, so you can do that. But the imperial guard have one that you can get from Forge World, which is a little, it's like 20 quid. Um, but you can get like a little basilisk, which like has like anti-air shells that shoot up, and, like a hydra flak and stuff. So I think it'd be quite fun to do. Yeah, cool. There you go. Look anyway, to may- maybe maybe one day we'll talk about it on the podcast. I, we might even be able to convince OT into if if he only has to spend like twenty pounds. Yeah, if if we it. convince him, it's the only game we're willing to play. Maybe. Maybe you'll do it. We're not playing Middle Earth anymore, AT. It's yeah. Aeronautica. <laughs> got to play Aeronautica now. And you've Come got on. to pick the faction you hate. Yeah. You've got to give them the Eldar or something. I think the Eldar, the Eldar right? I think the Eldar are really good, though. I think they're, yeah. there's, there's like a range of maneuvers that planes can do. So, like, the Orcs can only do, like, the basic, like, turning and stuff. Whereas I think the Eldar can do, like, wacky stuff like barrel rolls and, like, Complete loot de loops. Yeah, of course, and can, can. They can just ignore 80, the rules, basically. Just one one eighty and fly around everywhere. So I, I think that um, yeah, and like the little um, imperial guard ones have a rule where they can just stop moving because they ha- they can hover. Uh, of course. So they they can just stop and just become like little gunships, and you can just pivot and shoot. Whilst like the orcs have to keep moving forward because they're like old school planes. And yeah. Stuff. What, so their special rule is a, uh, a detriment, is what you're saying? Well, yes, but they're also really cheap. And because it's a you go, I go, the orc players often get like activations where they know where the enemy planes are going to be because all you've used up all your activations. Sure. So as I understand yeah. it, the orc players bring lots of DAC jets and yeah. they just fly them around to begin with. And then they save their ones with the big bombs and the guns till the end of the turn. Yeah. And then they can just like go and like kill something because makes the sense. Person can't react. So yeah. I think I, I don't know how well balanced it is, but I think that each team does have like a play style and that there is a little element of kind of rock, paper, scissors between all the different factions in terms of some are better against others than well. but yeah, yeah. Anyway, cool. I think we will um end at that. Yes. Uh so next week I think we're gonna be talking about rings of power. Ooh, a whole gonna episode on Rings of Power. I, I think what we're going to do is we're going to um, we're going to run through just talking about the show for a bit. So there there might not be that much hobby chat next week. And then I think our plans for kind of the future is we're going to um, talk about kind of Rings of Power, like house rules for Middle Earth, like what we'd like to see if it did. Because I. We we, we don't cool. know what we're doing. Me me and OT talked about the licensing and um that it's odd that Amazon hasn't done any merchandising because we're not sure whether they're allowed to basically. But if it ever if it ever happens, I think that um, there's going to be a lot of cool models that could be made from it. But I don't think it's going to happen. But there we go. But yeah, that that's what we'll be talking about next week. We're talking about Rings of Power, and OT will be back and he will be salty. And I, I imagine it will just be us listening to him rage. <laughs> yeah, the only um, 
the only episode he'll have been able to listen to in the meantime is this episode, which of course he's going to absolutely love. Yeah, it's good. I might just edit in just some, um, just a big old bit of law at the end. You should do it in the middle so he has to listen through it. Oh, oh yes. To finish shall listening I, to us. Shall I just read the um, Wikipedia page for the Imperial Fists? Yeah, just cut that in there. Just Brilliant. cut that in there. Every five minutes, just the Imperial Fist fact. <laughs> yeah, so the listeners obviously have really listened to all the Imperial Fist facts. You should uh, yeah. cut in a quiz at the end as well. A quiz. What was the name of the uh, first Emperor's Champion? That's a good one. That's a great question. Good one. I Do you know? No. Idea. no. Oh, it was uh, Sigismund. Sigismund. Oh, the, I guessed it. The founder Imperial of the Fist. Black Templars. Wait, Sigis Sigismund? But, Yes, Sigismund was a part of the Imperial Fists. He had his elite group called the Templars. Oh, I didn't know he founded the Black Templars. That's within really cool. within the Horus Heresy. But then when they get split into chapters, he, he takes some of the Imperial Fists off to become the Black Templars. And he was the first ever Emperor's Champion during the uh, Assault and Terror, I think. Why, why really are we cool. talking about this? Oh, yeah, because I'm was i I'm not actually going to cut in because that's too much effort. My uh, my colleagues reading the or listening to the um, uh, Siege of Terror book series, um, and he's absolutely loving it. I think I'm going to listen to it. Nice, yeah. I I, I just can't deal with all of the um, space marine porn that goes in. Yeah, there is a lot of that. But yeah. if you're if you're into it, then it's great. If if you're in if you're into descriptions of very muscly men, then they are the books for you. <laughs> Indeed. So off you go, OT. Give them a listen. Yeah, OT. Well, we look forward to your book report. Good. Yep. Right. It is goodbye from me and it is goodbye from the mayor. Goodbye, everyone. Have a fabulous weekend. And we will catch you next week.